and now uh, we talk about uh, continuing with our conversation about the karmic theory. Uh, we would like to talk about what are the loopholes or the criticisms of karmic theory. Now, if you look at the screen, we had talked in the last class, uh, talked earlier about uh, the various questions that comes to the mind when we talk about the karma theory. It is what about free will and what happens uh, to the realized souls, does all actions have a karmic effect, does the law of karma limit the autonomy of God, beginning of the karmic chain, benevolence and compassion towards the suffering would be intervening in the law of karma. Now, I find a very good exposition of critique that is faced by uh, the, the karma theory uh, in Karl Potter's work. Uh, Karl Potter was an uh, eminent Indian philosopher. Uh, in his uh, article, How Many Karma Theories Are There? So, here Karl Potter talks about um, many of these criticisms that we covered in the forms of questions. Now, let us first take a look that whether we find Karl Potter points out these very usual criticisms of the karmic theory and let us explore them in detail. Whether karma, whether this is uh, fatalistic in whether the karma theory promulgates a kind of fatalism or not. Well, uh, let us take a look at this. Now, if we find that uh, whatever action we do brings about its consequences, then the consequences are uh, uh, binding and then these consequences also are uh, uh, preemptors or actions or actions themselves. So, does this get a kind of uh, fatalism? Uh, the worry that many people have uh, uh, voiced is that well karmic theory uh, commits to a kind of fatalism. Uh, in fact, uh, um, on a more crucial note, uh, uh, let us uh, uh, the standard consolation that one has is uh, particularly in the uh, Indian scenario, may be more accurately in the rural agrarian scenario. That well, if I suffer uh, uh, a misfortune that is a result of my bad karma earlier. Now, this is what uh, Karl Potter uh, points out that this is perhaps uh, one of the foundational criticisms of law of karma that it brings upon brings about fatalism. That we see that well, whenever uh, uh, any uh, misfortune happens, it is uh, understood as a result of bad karma. Where is the problem? The problem is that well, we do not need to seek any solution to misfortune, and misfortune are uh, is taken as. Uh, uh, is taken as a given, is taken as a result of the past actions. Now, look at this uh, very interesting, it, if you transpose it to the uh, 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 current Indian scenario. Let us take a look at this, let us uh, imagine this. Most of the Indian ways of working are very, uh, uh, pay very little heed or regard to the uh, safety criteria that is a, a, a very empirically verifiable uh, feature. Uh, our, our motorcyclists do not use helmets, our car drivers do not use seat belts, our industries uh, flout safety norms, our transportation name the field, uh, uh, health care, everything uh, flout safety norms, our constructions, our engineering flout safety norms. Now, many of them could be understood that well, this is of course, of course economic reasons, but one lineage or that uh, uh, allows for or that uh, condescends this lack of safety awareness is perhaps a reading of the law of karma, because it causes a kind of fatalism that where accidents are seen not as any intentional event or uh, even by the very term accident, we mean something which was uh, unintentional or which was unplanned for or which just occurred. So, uh, giving responsibility is uh, only in the uh, narrow uh, range of events. So, even uh, calling an accident a collision gives a stronger uh, intentional stance to 
uh, the uh, to the event, which was say perhaps an accident between two vehicles. So, the karma theory, when it is criticized to be fatalistic, is criticized because this brings about a, a, a reduction in uh, responsibility of the agents involved. That if there is an earthquake, well, it was my or their bad karma that it happened, and that we need not. Uh, perhaps the next uh, step is that we need not explore why it happened or how it can be prevented. It brings in a kind of fatalism that well, whatever uh, had to happen has happened, nothing more, nothing less. So, this brings in a kind of uh, a fatalism. Now, there are various ways to answer that. Now, if you want to defend the law of karma, you would say that well, yes we do see in fact, that there are uh, 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 misfortunes that occur in spite of all the precautions that we take. Titanic did sink, although it was touted as a, an unsinkable ship, uh, space shuttles do fall off. So, in spite of all our caution, there may be something that goes wrong, and that is linked to the law of karma. It is also not preventing us from finding the cause of these uh, karma, uh, or, or these misfortunes. Uh, law of karma nowhere tells you, that you will not find out uh, the cause of these bad actions, and you will not uh, 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 take precautions, or you will not take actions to prevent these from happening before. Notice, what is binding, or what is determined in the law of karma, is that a bad action gets a bad result. As uh, uh, our former president, Sarvepalli, late Sarvepalli Radhakrishnan, uh, said that well, the law of karma is conservation in the uh, law of moral universe. So, in the moral universe, nothing is lost, every action has a reaction. So, every uh, uh, intentional action, every desireful action has a result. So, according to the law of karma, when I am answering to the charge of fatalism, uh, if I have to defend the law of karma, or the defenders of the law of karma have put it, that well, uh, uh, in spite of your best efforts, there can be events out of your control. That is a result of uh, uh, bad karma, but you are constantly creating new karmic uh, uh, balance. It is like you are uh, uh, running a corporation, and you inherit some bad debts, some uh, uh, bad assets. Now, that is what you inherit, but that does not come binding to you, that you make bad decisions thereafter. You can turn around the uh, uh, path of the corporation, by taking accurate decisions, taking right decisions, accumulating good karma, ac accumulating good assets, accumulating uh, uh, revenue and that is seen as a, as, as a, as a, uh, a almost a funny analogy, between a bank account, and a, the karmic account. So, you have to face, what you have done, but that does not bind you, that it continues as a cycle. That everything you see, where the defect lies, uh, when uh, the charge of fatalism is uh, laid upon uh, the karmic theory, is that. bad actions, lead to bad consequences, or wicked consequences. But, life or actions, are not consequences, or consequent events. So, this is what, where we deny, that well, uh, the law of karma does not claim fatalism, because it is only saying that well, uh, let me put it in a figurative uh, analogy. Say, if x leads to y, and y has to lead to z. Well, this is the problem, when we see of, when we see the 
law of karma as fatalistic, right. But when we see the law of karma as, uh, as it, uh, as its advocates would like you to have, is that a bad action leads to a bad consequence. But what happens here, will have its own consequences. So, this may have consequences as B, and this may have consequences C. So, this is what is according to the karmic theory, this is wrong, and this is right. That it is in this moment, that we have free choice. And this free choice determines the results that we get. Okay. Now, we talk about the second critique that has been uh, very often faced by uh, the karmic theory, is that it is a retributive ethical theory. Now, if what, what is meant by retributive ethical theory. Now, when we talk about uh, um, the law of karma, and we have had uh, theories of punishment, and one of the theories of punishment is that, well, if something uh, wrong has been done, to avenge that wrong, one has to uh, do another similar act. For example, an eye for an eye, or uh, uh, a punishment that causes the same, if not more harm than what the action caused. So, this is retribution, uh, in a way uh, taking revenge. Now, what is karmic theory doing, when it says that, well it is retributive. Retributive karmic theory would mean that, every action is being revenged. Every action has an impersonal principle taking revenge. So, if I do something good, I get something good, and if I do something bad, I get something bad. So, this is a kind of a very retributive theory, that well, what is missing here? Well, what is missing here, as in other religious ethics, we would talk about, is the notion of, what about grace, forgiveness, compassion, etcetera. Now, the critiques of karma theory would be saying that, well, this is simply a vindictive theory, that well, uh, they here I give you something good, and there you get something good, and uh, uh, you do something bad, and you get something bad in return. But is not this, there something wrong with it as an ethical theory, that where is the whole concept of uh, 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 retribution. So, when uh, uh, even in the Indian tradition, this is a problem with the uh, karmic theory, because uh, strongly theistic uh, schools of uh, Vedanta, or other theistic schools have uh, uh, argued for the forgiveness received from God, or of uh, daya, of, uh, uh, of being ameliorated of your uh, uh, sins. Now, let me look at, uh, let me put it in a very uh, uh, non-religious uh, uh, the, uh, non way. If I do something wrong, and I genuinely repent it, I wish I would not have done it, right. I still face the uh, consequence that comes from it, if the law of karma holds. On the other hand, say you have done something equally wicked, and you have enjoyed it, and you do not have any regret or repentance about it, where uh, uh, you also face the consequence of the action. So, uh, let's, uh, putting it simplistically, action 1, action 2, action 1 has regret, action 2 has no regret. consequence continues to be the same. If 
a 1 is similar to a 2. So, regret is, uh, is not uh, shown in the equation that well there is simply no regret that uh, or uh, no, that, no sorry forgive me not simply no regret, but that regret does not have any moral value in the moral calculus. Uh, feeling of repentance or regret seems to be irrelevant. Now, that is where perhaps an ethical theory is not capturing the whole uh, uh, plethora of human conduct. Now, if you are a, a defender of the karmic theory, you would say that well, yes you are right that well an action an evil done or a good deed done will get its consequences. Even if you repent or do not repent or if you are proud of it or you are not proud of it, yes guilty to that charge. But for somebody who repents definitely their actions would be revised and better thereof. So, uh, the one who is a habitual offender, a repeated offender is the one who does not have the regret repentance factor in the in working. Whereas, the one who is uh, having regret and repentance, it does not as uh, one could say become a vasana, does not become a, a sanskar, does not become a quality or a property or a tendency. It does not become a tendency of the agent to repeat these wrongdoings. But again look at it uh, uh, this way that the, uh, that the uh, agent no matter how good he be or she be, if he or she has committed something right or wrong is bound to get the reward or punishment for the same, that there is no way of amelioration, it has to be a zero sum game. Now, uh, theistic schools in fact, uh, we will come to a criticism of the theory of karma, which has even called uh, theory of karma as impersonal and naturalistic, that is the last point that we would be tackling. But uh, look at it this way. Now, the uh, uh, very fact that it makes the moral calculus so perfect, that the left hand side and the right hand side are to be balance that it does not matter, uh, whether one has a sense of uh, repentance or regret. In fact, there is no intervention possible, that uh, uh, no matter how much of a, of a uh, 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 forgiveness I seek, even from uh, divinity, it does not work. We will talk about this in the next uh, point coming about. So, when we talk about retributive ethical theory, we see that well, uh, law of karma tends to be a, a, a retributive theory, it is taking revenge, but the advocates of karma theory would say that well, it is not taking revenge, it is just giving you the uh, uh, fruit of your actions, but it is nowhere influencing you to repeat certain uh, these kinds of actions, or it is not discounting the sense of regret, that is setting about another chain of events. Secondly, human uh, uh, predicament is always uh, a battle between good and bad, a battle between desire and duty, and this is what characterizes human predicament. The law of karma is being cold to this human predicament. It is seeing once uh, it is not uh, uh, valuing the temptation, the urge, the desires that a human being goes through and sometimes succumbs to it, sometimes overpowers it. So, uh, it expects perhaps um, as the critiques would say too much out of human beings, it makes it a cold calculative principle. Now, coming to the uh, third criticism that has been laid against the law of karma as put out by Karl Potter is that it is unduly egoistic. Well, what do you mean by unduly egoistic? It is said to be unduly and I quote uh, Karl Potter, it is said to be unduly egoistic, 
because it gives too much responsibility to people to force men to turn inwards and predicate their lives on a selfish desire for their own uh, improvement and eventual release with no attention to their fellow man true charity real love for others becoming irrelevant okay what's meant by this well when i say that uh, the law of karma is unduly egoistic is that well look at it this way why does one do a good action or why does one perform a morally qualified action good or bad or a morally qualifiable action well according to the law of karma it could be because you expect something out of it that well you do good you accumulate credit again going back to the bank analogy that well you are doing good for no 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 reason other than for accumulating it for yourself so this is kind of making it shrewd cunning and exceedingly selfish now when uh, the uh, agent performs an action with the anticipation that this action will give uh, him or her will accumulate more desert for him or her give entail him or her for a lib uh, for liberation or self improvement or better uh, advantages in this or coming life well something in the moral equation or calculus is m missing and that is missing is the sense of true charity true charity or selflessness that well where are actions that do not that do not have a uh, selfless uh, intent that well uh, initial part of the moral uh, domain or the value domain has been that well good has been done for its own sake not for something else in this case it is purely teleological it is not deontological at all it is teleological because it gets you uh, advantages later so therefore it is your own advantages so the law of karma can be seen as purely purposive or teleological not deontological at all now the fourth issue that we that is uh, characterized by in the article of karl potter is that the law of karma is said to be unrealistic well why is it said to be unrealistic again i quote from karl potter it says quote leaving aside the point that it is unverifiable the theory can only hope to explain events by invoking god or fate since a simple connecting of actions with results cannot possibly succeed given the complexity of nature especially human nature unquote now uh, what is meant by uh, uh, unrealistic well the law of karma says that well when we have an action we have a result simple as that what is unrealistic about this is that in this entire domain gamut of uh, human actions which is so complicated uh, having such a simple action to action connect uh, is first unverifiable and second it is uh, uh, if it, it will have to sneak in through the back door an assumption of a god or a higher agency to perhaps uh, connect these uh, actions now let's look at it this way uh, in fact many of us can draw very uh, interesting uh, tributaries or uh, inter interesting uh, uh, lines of thinking that how this uh, law of karma as a theory has uh, influenced the uh, indian or the uh, uh, civilizations wherever it is uh, widely believed in well when every action has to have its own results it rules away selfless actions it rules away selfless actions for uh, 
uh, actions done for, without any benefit, actions done for its own self. So, every event or every action has to be incentivized. Now, that is one reading that one can make out of the law of karma. Uh, it is unrealistic in the sense that, well, it could be a uh, 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 Marxist sociological reading of the law of karma could be that, it is to implant uh, a fear of uh, deserts to prevent uh, uh, evil actions and to reward good actions, and therefore to make society more stable, because in principle it is unverifiable. So, even when we see that in this life people are uh, doing good and uh, suffering and doing evil and prospering, it is rationalized that in some other life they have done something to deserve this and their actions in the current life will entail better actions in the future. So, apart from the fact it is unverifiable, it could be a very scheming sociological, religious, psychological phenomena or uh, a construct to preserve social order. It is uh, unrealistic in the sense that, how to we connect and how actions are to be, uh, uh, how intentions actually transport them, how is the law of karma or what is the means of execution, how is our intention uh, uh, factored into this uh, equation. And then, uh, let us come to the uh, final view or final uh, line of criticism that is faced by uh, uh, the law of karma is that it is naturalistic. Because considering just now as uh, when we talked about in the fourth point, that unrealistic, that we need to assume a God or an entity to connect. Well, law of karma does not make any such assumptions. It is supposed to be a cold, impersonal principle. It leaves no scope for God or any uh, higher agencies it is uh, naturalistic. So, it follows almost a naturalistic order. Now, what is it that we are meaning, when we call something naturalistic? When we call something naturalistic, we mean that well, it exists in the state of nature, and uh, nature follows laws. And therefore, uh, there are natural, just as there are natural laws, that uh, laws such as gravitation. So, there are laws such as karma. So, that is uh, almost making it a fact of human existence, perhaps a naturally perceivable fact of human existence. Now, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, it as a cold impersonal principle, we are saying that well, there is no role that the notion uh, that uh, God or the notion of uh, God plays in this uh, uh, law of karma. So, when we talk about the theistics, when we seek grace, when we seek forgiveness, when we seek that well, uh, uh, amelioration, when we seek uh, uh, blessings to cancel out our evil, uh, uh, cancel, out, cancel out our wicked deeds, it is blank to that. That well, that is simply not possible. It is something like a loan that has been taken, and it has to be paid. To a defender of the law of karma, would say that well, yes, by doing more actions, you can perhaps neutralize it, unless until it's become part of the karma. Now there is a long sequence of events which we will talk about, uh, which we have already talked about, and maybe focus a little bit in the uh, coming time. Is that how actually an event becomes a karmic event? that what becomes a prarabdha action, what becomes an action that you have to, that yields a result necessarily. So, considering that, uh, well according to the law of karma, well it is an impersonal cold naturalistic principle. There is no forgiveness, there is no negotiation. In fact, uh, uh, if I may uh, provide a rather funny analogy, is that when you deal with a, 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 a government department or uh, the judiciary. You expect it to go by the rules, and you go by the rules. And if you are having a punishment, and say if there is a sufficiently corrupt judiciary, 
and you are uh, pa uh, part of the accused or you are on the team of the accused, you would like to step outside and say, well, my dear judge, I offer you something and uh, please uh, uh, lessen my sentence or let me off and you try to negotiate, you try to negotiate. We try to negotiate every time in life that we see that, well, we deserve this according to the rules and we do not deserve this according to the rules and the rule enforcer ought to do this. But, in that equation, we step beside that and do a little bit of negotiation that, well, we require this, let us get this. Now, uh, to the defender of the law of karma, uh, if there is a God's ability to forgive uh, evil acts, it is this kind of a negotiation. It is unfair that uh, uh, a deed is uh, left unrewarded or unpunished, that, uh, that the deed does not yield its results. How is this, uh, is not this unfair? So, to the defender of uh, uh, the karmic theory, it is very fair that this is, that the karmic principle is cold and impersonal. And to the uh, uh, critique of the karmic theory, it is uh, making the th uh, ethical domain completely naturalistic and taking away uh, the power of discretion or the power of forgiveness of any religious entity so claimed.